Great. Thank you very much. So let me uh, start off my conflicts. Uh, just to give a quick review of the RNA that we use, uh, we deliver nucleoside modified purified mRNA. And the reason we do this is that currently there are 17 different innate immune receptors that recognize RNA, make interferons, pro-inflammatory cytokines, apoptosis, and inhibit translation. So our thinking when we first started these studies was that modification of the mRNA, there's 140 modifications currently identified, would reduce the immunogenicity, the ability to induce those cytokines, chemokines, interferons, etc. So what uh, Katie Carrico and I did is we made mRNAs with a variety of different modified nucleosides with and without purification. Now it turns out that the purification is critical because in vitro transcription reactions that are used to make mRNA produce double-stranded RNA contaminants. And these contaminants induce interferons, cytokines, and activate a number of those receptors. So what we found is that when we did this, we could increase translation by four logs so four times as much protein produced with a modified and purified mRNA. We could also get rid of all of the interferons, cytokine, and other pro-inflammatory gene activation of treated cells, dendritic cells, and animals. The other critical thing about RNA that differs from DNA is that RNA is a highly efficient transfection process. So in culture, 80, 90 plus percent of cells take up RNA and make protein. And similarly in vivo, 90 plus percent of cells that are exposed to the mRNA take it up and make protein. Resting does not matter. So what are the advantages of using an mRNA as a therapeutic protein delivery system? And there are many. The first is that if you look at a GMP facility for making therapeutic proteins or antibodies, this is what it looks like. And what you're dealing with are 50,000 liter drums of CHO or other cells, followed by extensive purification procedures involving multiple columns and other purifications. Every protein, you have to redo the purification. Every protein is different. So the cost of monoclonal antibody therapy is in the $5,000 to $10,000 per dose range because of all of these difficulties. With mRNA, it's made as a single reaction. It's purified in a single reaction. It uh, leads to greatly simplified GMP production and the production is identical no matter what the coding sequence is. So this is thought that it's going to result in much reduced cost of production of mRNA, uh, and I'll show you some of the advantages. So what can you use modified RNA for? Well, you can deliver extracellular proteins, intracellular proteins, you can gene edit, you can do vaccines, and I'll show you some new data on new ways of delivering to specific cell types. So the way that we deliver uh, modified RNA are using lipid nanoparticles. These are currently part of an FDA-approved drug by Alnylam called Patisseran that delivers siRNAs for TTR amyloidosis. Uh, the lipid nanoparticles are usually made up of four different lipids that self-assemble. They form particles about 80 nanometers in side, size, that, but they, they bind APOE as their mediator of uptake into hepatocytes. They're very safe. They're, they're in an FDA-approved drug. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with a delivery of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. And the first one I'm going to talk about is VRCO1 that was just mentioned. It's a broadly neutralizing, decently potent HIV monoclonal antibody. We made separate RNAs for the heavy and light chains, 
combined them together and put them into lipid nanoparticles and gave them to a variety of different mice. When we did that, what we found is that we could give a dose of about a mg per kg and obtain levels in the 200 microgram per mil range. Compared to VRCO1 protein, which requires 600 micrograms, which is 20 mg per kg, to obtain lower levels. The, there was a, a fairly linear dose response in RNA to monoclonal antibody production. But what was striking that when we then challenged the humanized mice treated with RNA encoding VRCO1, a dose of a half a mg per kg could completely protect them from challenge with a variety of viruses. So this is 1 40th the amount of protein needed to obtain protection. We've given a variety of other monoclonal antibodies uh, by a variety of different routes. Th this is a, a human anti-influenza antibody. A mg per kg dose is giving us titers in the 300 microgram per mil range. With increased improvements in the mRNA and delivery systems, we are routinely getting 500 to 600 micrograms per mil of monoclonal antibody with a mg per kg of RNA. We've also given RNA encoding monoclonal antibodies to macaques. This is an anti-SIV envelope monoclonal antibody, and we're measuring neutralization. And we can see that with a dose of a mg per kg in a macaque, We've got high levels, so out in the one to a thousand dilution range that lasts for greater than 14 days in these animals. So it's effective in large animals as well as small animals. Now, one of the bigger programs in my lab are, is, is our vaccine platform using modified RNA LNPs. The reason for this, and the reason we started to look at uh, modified RNA in a vaccine, was its delivery parameters. So when we took a nucleoside modified RNA, put it into an LNP, injected it really by any route, what we could see is long levels of antigen production. So two weeks of antigen production from these animals. This is an intradermal immunization. What that means is that you have long-lived production of immunogen with long-lived loading of germinal center reactions. So essentially, this is like a, vi a live virus vaccine using an mRNA. So one of our first programs looked at influenza. The, the background influenza is a pan uh, epidemic with uh, occasional pandemics that leads to hundreds of thousands of deaths across the world. Uh, the vaccines currently in use are at best fair. They average 50 to 60 percent uh, efficacy, uh, which varies every year depending on how well the CDC and other organizations can guess. So we immunized BALBC mice with a nucleoside modified mRNA LNP encoding hemagglutinin, and we measured HAI titers. So HAI titers measure the ability of the antibody response to block sialic acid binding by the influenza virus, which is how the virus enters a cell. So it's a, a pseudo-neutralization assay. What was striking is that this is the, yeah, I'll get that. The, the inactivated virus vaccination is what's used in us elderly folks now, just an IM inactivated virus. Titers of 1 to 40 are protective. Th this is a typical response. The live virus vaccine given intranasally in mice uh, the, gives titers in the 1 to 500 range. This is what we give to our kids. A nucleoside mRNA vaccine gave titers that were five times higher than live virus infection in these animals, titers in the 1 to 2,500 range. So we then looked at what does the B cell response to this mRNA vaccination look like? 
So when a B cell sees an antigen, the follicular B cells bind the antigen, they receive various toll and other innate immune receptor activations. They interact with CD4 positive T cells, which turns them and forms germinal centers. In the germinal center, you have massive proliferation and antigen selection of the B cells that results in the production of plasma cells and memory B cells. So now we're comparing modified mRNA immunization to a, an activated virion immunization. We're measuring antigen-specific B cells, and then we're typing them for type of B cells. So what we see is that there's a one and a half log increase in the number of germinal center B cells in the spleen or lymph nodes of these animals. These are the cells that are antigen selecting and maturing against the HA. Similarly, we have a log and a half more memory B cells and a log and a half more long-lived plasma cells after a single immunization with mRNA encoding hemagglutinin. We looked at these animals 13 months later, and we looked in their bone marrow for long-lived plasma cells. And what we saw is that we had a, a percentage of, point of 1 in 2,000 nucleated cells in the bone marrow were making HA antibody. So the, the bone marrow people in this room know that that's a higher frequency than any other progenitor cell in the bone marrow. It's an incredibly high number. In addition, in the spleen, we had high levels of both memory and long-lived plasma cells after 13 months of a single immunization. What's the mechanism for this vaccine? So we've done a lot of investigations, and the mechanism is that it, the mRNA LNPs specifically induce T follicular helper cells. So TFHs are the CD4 population that B cells interact with. They form germinal centers, they produce IL-21, they drive germinal center B cell proliferation, somatic mutation, affinity maturation, they produce class switch, they produce long-lived plasma cells and memory cells. We measured TFHs in mice using the standard assay, and when we gave them an mRNA LNP, we saw about a tenfold increase in the total number of TFHs in the spleen or lymph node. We've also looked at macaques, and what we found in macaques, we did a comparison to double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA was thought to be the most potent adjuvant for inducing TFH cell responses. And we're using an HIV envelope immunogen uh, uh, from CH505. And what you can see, and it's very clear, that the envelope mRNA LNP gives incredibly potent TFH responses compared to the best adjuvant out there. We characterize the TFHs from these animals. They make high levels of IL-21 and 4, so they're active TFH cells. What was most interesting from our influenza studies is that what we're immunizing with full-length cell surface or secreted HA. And we know that you have to change the vaccine every year because the head mutates and the head is immunodominant the majority of the response is made against the head. So uh, we set up an assay that measured head and stock responses. So you can see on the right that that's using an H1 stock and head, which is identical to what's in the vaccine. In the middle, we've now substituted an H6, which is a group two unrelated head where there's no response. An H1 immunization gives you no antibodies that bind to the H6 head. So what we're measuring there are only stock responses. And what you can see is that we're getting a very potent stock response using a full HA mRNA LNP immunization. When these animals are boosted, the stock response is equally boosted very well. So what does that mean? we challenge the animals with distant H1 viruses. So the, on the 
right, you can see the HAI titers in an ACAL immunized mouse against the PR8 virus. And there are no HAI responses. There are no head pseudo-neutralization responses. But when animals were challenged, they were completely protected from infection. We made it more difficult, and we challenged these animals with a very distant H5 avian virus. Again, no HAI titers, no head binding at all. Animals were completely protected from infection. So this is saying that a full-length HA, when given as an mRNA LNP, induces stock responses that give protection against mutated, drifted, and very different uh, clade viruses. We've got a lot of different programs, vaccine programs ongoing. I thought I would show you our HSV2 vaccine results. Uh, HSV2 is a very common, it causes genital tract infection in humans. Uh, half a billion, 11% of the worldwide population is infected. It's a difficult virus because many people get very ill. Uh, immunosuppressed people get ill. And worse off, it's transmitted to infants causing severe disease. Uh, in addition, HSV causes a three to four fold increase in risk of infection by HIV-1. So the approach that we took uh, with HSV-2 is a trimeric vaccine. And what we did is we targeted two antigens that are known for their immune evasion properties. So GC blocks complement binding and activation. GE binds the FC receptor and blocks ADCC activity. And our thinking is that if you combine that with an antigen that protects against cell binding, virus entry, and spread, it'll give you a more potent vaccine because you're blocking the immune evasion properties of the virus. We compared our vaccine to either GD mRNA alone or trivalent subunit proteins. Now the comparison here is two mRNA immunizations versus three protein immunizations. And we can see, still see much higher antibody binding for, to both GC, GD, and GE. What's striking is that combining three different protein RNAs together, we had no drop in response to, to the GD, the shared. We measured neutralization titers and saw the same thing. Again, high titers of neutralization, much greater than three immunizations of protein. In the bottom, we're measuring the, uh, the, the, uh, the ability of these antibodies to block GC and GE immune evasion. I won't go into the details, but we see the mRNA induces much better blocking of immune evasion activities. This is a table of a challenge, and what, what's striking is that uh, the control animals that got poly-C RNA, every animal developed disease, all of the animals were, had to be euthanized, they had high levels of viral replication in the genital tract, and all of their uh, dorsal root ganglia had HSV2 DNA in them. Comparing the protein to the mRNA, we see the mRNA completely protected from any viral replication in the genital tract after uh, infection. It nearly completely blocked DRG viral presence. Um, and we, we estimated that we had close to 98% sterilizing immunity with the mRNA vaccine compared to about 75% sterilized in immunity with the trivalent vaccine. There have been a handful of HSV2 vaccines that have gone into clinical trials. None of them had sterilized in immunity going into the trial. None of them were effective in humans and they've all been terminated. So our, our conclusions from our vaccine studies is that nucleoside modified mRNA is an incredibly potent vaccine it works well in small and large animals. 
Its mechanism of action is the induction of T follicular helper cells. Now what's interesting is if you look at the modified RNA LNPs and you put them in animals or if you give them to dendritic cells in culture, they make no type 1 interferons. They make no pro-inflammatory cytokines. So there's no obvious adjuvant activity from this vaccine, which means that there's a specific mechanism that induces T follicular helper cells, which is currently being investigated. To me, probably the, the most interesting part of this, though, is that the vaccine induces subdominant responses. So in addition to seeing the head of influenza, it also sees the stalk. We've seen similar things in our malaria, HSV, and HSV2 vaccines, where we get potent subdominant epitope responses. Now, I wanted to sort of end my talk showing you some brand new data, um, which addresses the question, what if you want to target an LNP to another cell type? And I thought the gene therapy people would be interested in this. Because currently, LNPs are used to target the liver, because they, they bind APOE receptors, uh, and they're very effective at delivering proteins and gene editing technology into the liver. But they're no good for anything else. So what we did is we developed a way of modifying lipid nanoparticles so that we could target other tissues, cell types, and organs. So this involves attaching antibodies, pieces of antibodies, receptor ligands, other proteins to the surface of a lipid nanoparticle. When we do this, we see that we don't change the morphology or the characteristics, the, the zeta potential. The size increases, which corresponds to the addition of a layer of protein to the surface of the particle. These particles were coated with an anti-PCAM antibody. Um, and we see we get high levels of binding to PCAM. We get expression of the mRNA, in this case luciferase, in the PCAM positive cells. We transfected primary human UVEC cells in culture, delivered GFP. 100% of the cells express high levels of protein when they're PCAM targeted. If you look at pictures of animals that have been giving PCAM-targeted LNPs, PCAM is highly expressed in lung endothelial cells. And we can see that we're now lighting up the lung um, in animals that have PCAM directed against it. This is a, a variety of ways of showing the increased uptake of PCAM-directed LNPs into the lung, we see we get very high levels no matter how you measure it. My lab has a big interest in HIV, and we've got a, a grant with Amphar and Gates looking at targeting CD4 positive T cells, the purpose of which is to deliver gene editing technologies that can inactivate or remove HIV provirus as part of a cure strategy. So the, the first thing is we needed to develop a way to bind CD4 T cells, and we found uh, a variety of, of ligands and uh, antibodies that could effectively bind. The, the critical problem is that CD4 positive and all T cells don't have free endocytic activity. So they're very difficult to transfect with lipids, polysaccharides, glycans, any kind of particle. But what we found is that binding to the LNP to the CD4 used the CD4's capacity to endocytose, which brought the LNP into the cell, allowed the RNA to be freed into the cytoplasm and translated. And we got decent levels of translation with CD4 targeting in these animals. We delivered the CD4 targeted LNPs in vivo Again, uh, our pictures show we now have high levels of splenic uptake with a CD4 targeted LNP. We purified the spleen cells, purified out the T cells, and show that the LUC activity is in fact in the T cells and not other CD4 positive T cells in this animal. 
But what was most striking is we went back and we imaged the animals that had had all of their organs removed. And what we saw was that we were, we were targeting lymph nodes. Uh, here's paraortic and inguinal lymph nodes that are being targeted with an intravenous delivery of CD4 targeted LNPs. So the LNPs are getting out of the bloodstream and into the lymph nodes, are able to bind and transfect and deliver uh, encoded protein to T cells throughout the body. We've got other images that where we've lit up the intestines, every lymph node in the body. Um, it, it's a, a, a very effective delivery system. We wanted to see, could we deliver gene editing technology? So here we're using a Cree lock system and we're delivering mRNA encoding Cree recombinase. What we can see is that we get very high levels, around 40 to 50 percent of T cells in vivo are gene edited with Cree mRNA LNP delivery. Um, similar levels in lymph nodes. For the fun of it, we analyzed all of the GFP or ZS green positive cells. We saw that we were targeting both lymph nodes, uh, CD4 T cells, macrophages, monocytes, and dendritic cells in these animals. We've developed a, a new system that targets all T cells and gives us levels of 80% gene editing in vivo. So our conclusions are that we've developed a targeting ability for LNPs that could have wide-ranging activities. We've got targeting to bone marrow stem cells, heart, lung, brain, uh, T cells in general. We can deliver Cas proteins that can treat bone marrow stem cell genetic deficiencies. We can deliver CAR Ts in vivo, uh, thereby reducing the, the difficulty of CAR T cell therapies. And I um, need to thank my collaborators and take some questions. Thank you for a really nice talk. Um, maybe I'll start uh, with your antibody delivery. Uh, I couldn't really tell, sorry, it might have been the angle I was at, but how long does your expression go um, with? So it, it, it depends on the antibody. We think, and we have some preliminary data, that if you use a, an FC-modified antibody, an LS or LALA modifications, we'll get uh, therapeutic levels for probably approaching six months in a human, uh, if the human data follows that of macaques. So that there it's really modifying the antibody to last a long time. So would expression uh, from the mRNA happen over a period of weeks and then the antibody would persist for months or what's the mechanism? Yeah, probably days to weeks depending on how you give it and then the antibody uh, stays around as long as the FC allows. Okay, thank you. Interesting data. Um, as your mRNA is not, is also taken up into DC, um, would that also prime CD8 T cell responses, or do you think it's really mainly about activating T follicular helper, helper CD4 T cells? So um, what, what we see, we see very potent CD4 cell responses. We see decent, not great CD8s. One of the problems that CD8s require type 1 interferons to be produced, and we don't make any type 1 interferons, so we're not, we don't get a great CD8 response. Um, you said that to retarget, you have to bind uh, mono an antibody to the LNP. So how is it going to complicate the manufacturing of the LNP, the costs, uh, the um, scale you will be able to reach? So uh, we're now doing studies uh, to address that. What we're using single chain FABs that can be made in bacteria. Uh, we've developed better methods to cross-link to the lipid. We, we can add the lipid uh, antibody to the LNP production process, so we don't add anything to the LNP production. Um, I, I think it'll, it isn't going to be cheap, 
but I, I think we'll be able to uh, do large scale production. Versus for the antibody production, because for the immunizing, the impurity of the double stranded RNA might actually be a plus. And I was wondering if you have a different way of preparing the RNA for that. Yes, so we don't see that. We see impurity, so impurities make type 1 interferons. Type 1 interferons inhibit TFH responses. So if we've got any interferon production, the antibody response drops and we get no TFH cells. Uh, very interesting. So sometimes when benchmarking against different platforms, it's complex to compare kind of apples and oranges. So have you ever compared flu mist to RNA, and have you done those comparisons per unit RNA, that is molecules versus, uh, you know, milligram quantities of messenger RNA versus uh, TCID50 of an R uh, the virus? So one of the bigger problems that we're addressing is that we don't know how much protein is made when you give RNA. So it, it's impossible to make a comparison between micrograms of HA protein and micrograms of RNA. We know for antibodies it's usually about 40 times more, but every protein is going to be different. Um, I, I think the, the big difference, though, is for, for protein, if you use an adjuvant, you're using MF59 or, or CPG or something else. Th those adjuvants work by inducing Th1, Th2 responses. Our RNA LNPs act as a TFH adjuvant, which is very different, which isn't shared by any other adjuvant currently in study. And the TFHs are what give you the potent antibody responses. Actually, uh, I was more referring to like <clears throat> flu mist is a attenuated virus that has its own messenger RNA, or rather its RNA genome. If you were comparing the copies of RNA in that vaccine to the copies of RNA in the messenger RNA, I mean, that would be more of a pound for pound comparison. Yeah, but th th that RNA is not nucleoside modified. So it, it induces type 1 interferons and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it's a very different RNA. No. OK. Uh, I'll, uh, we're running a bit late. I'll just want to ask one question. Uh, you said in the macaque experiments that you were around the dose was one milligram per kilogram. What kind of dose would you expect in humans? Because then we're talking maybe 30. It gets very expensive. Yeah, so w w we have no idea for doses for monoclonal antibody replacement. For vaccines, uh, we, we immunize mice with 3 to 10 micrograms, rabbits, guinea pigs, a little more. Macaques, we give 50 micrograms and get maximal responses. So my guess for a vaccine, humans would probably require 100 micrograms, which is a very small amount and uh, relatively inexpensive vaccine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.